Y'all okay this morning? Awesome. Hey, my name is Jeremy. I'm a servant leader here at Stonegate, uh, like many of you out there. And uh, I spend a lot of my time over at our Odessa campus. Uh, really excited that that's almost done. And I uh, can't wait to get into the new building over there. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm really honored to be able to sing and worship our King with you this morning. And so let's stand to our feet and we'll get started. Thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. But teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above. Fixed upon his mount of thy redeeming love. This morning we raise our stone of remembrance. Well, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm called, and I hope I. Good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interpose. Oh, come. 
has saved us through His Son, Jesus Christ. We celebrate that this morning.
this morning with his goodness and his mercy let's declare this together you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost when you have caught me found you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost when you have called me found? You chase me down, you seek me out. How could I be lost when you have called me found? Oh, like a child. we finish out our time together just want to sing this song it's assurance of our faith that Jesus has paid it all on our behalf we celebrate that this morning and I hear the Savior say thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. The leper's and melt 
sing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed in white as snow. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. We declare this. It's our praise and response. But he washed it white as snow. Yes, amen. Hey, let, let's pray together. God, we, uh, we really, we do celebrate in this moment as we, your gathered church, have sung four songs about who you are. God, we say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for taking broken lives and making them new. Thank you, taking, thank you God, for taking uh, dead lives and making us alive. And so, God, we say thank you. God, we stand in awe of you today in this, in this place as we gather. Um, God, as we open up your word here in a couple of minutes, God, would you, by your Holy Spirit, help us understand life through, through new eyes where Jesus is high and lifted up and he is the center. God, we love you. Some of us are growing to love you. Some of us are skeptical about your love. And regardless of where you find us, God, may your name be honored in this place. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Our ushers are going to make their way down uh, front to take our offering. And uh, we, we do this every week. We give uh, because Jesus, who is rich, became poor that's, that we might become rich. And so if you're our guest and please don't feel any obligation to give. This is, this is time for those of us who call this place home, member partners. And, and so uh, thank you guys for being here. My name's Eric Clark, one of the guys here on staff. And I, I want to communicate to you guys a couple things that we think are important that we want you to know about. Uh, and the first is this Start Here card that's in the seat back in front of you. We would love for you to take this card and, and fill it out, put it in the basket or take it to our info desk because uh, we're... Uh, of the belief here that every single one of you in this auditorium have a next step with Jesus. Uh, whether you've been here forever and your next step may be to serve him or maybe, you've, maybe you're just skeptical and you want to learn more about him through our next steps uh, process or you want to get involved in a group, every single one of us, including myself, have a next step with Jesus. And this is the best way for you to help us help you take that next step. Uh, the second thing is uh, really a class that's coming up August 29th. It's called Perspectives. It's a 13-week intensive class that really helps expand your view of who God is and what God is doing, not only here in the Permian Basin, but to the ends of the earth. It's an it's a intensive class that, that really is going to help us see God 
and see his mission throughout the world. And so we would love for you guys uh, to, to take part. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, to be really honest. It's 13 weeks, but it's an incredibly um, rewarding and fruitful process. Uh, now, the class starts October 29th. Um, uh, but we're having early bird uh, registrations up through the end of this month. We'd love for you to go outside to our missions kiosk, see Michelle, see our staff there if you're interested in that. The final thing I want you guys to be aware of is August 18th and 19th, we're hosting a two-day event. It's called Mr. and Mrs. Marriage Workshop. And, and really what this is, it's going to be a fun and very uh, practical weekend where regardless of what stage your marriage is in, whether you're newly married or you've been married uh, 30 plus years, it's gonna be a weekend of fun, togetherness, dancing, music. Yes, I said dancing, um, music, but also practical tools to help you in your marriage. If you have any questions or if that interests you, you can go out and see Joe and the, and the adult staff at the adult kiosk or the info desk. Um, so good to be with you. We're going to continue on in our series uh, through the Wisdom Psalms. And I'm going to turn over to my very good friend, Jeff Turner, our Odessa campus minister. Well, hey, good morning. How are y'all, Stonegate? Good. Well, I'm so glad to be with you again. This will be my last week to be with you as uh, next week we are going to be getting out of our building in Odessa, getting out of Bonham, getting into our new one. So... I am tickled pink. That's how I feel. So uh, next week you'll have Patrick. He'll be with you guys um, up here, and I'll be in, in Odessa as we're finishing up and getting out of Bonham. It has been a it is, it's been a wonderful three years. It's been a hard three years. It's been one of those three years where you ask the Lord, "Hey, what are we doing here in a stinky junior high?" And yet the Lord uh, continues to show that He's faithful uh, during that whole time. We've grown so much these last three years that it's now kind of surreal to look now and go, oh, wow, we are about to get out of this building and get into our building. So it is, we're at a stage where things are coming together. And uh, even today as we speak, <clears throat> we're going to be getting all of our sound and audio stuff out of Bonham, getting that over there, getting that put into the building. It's just exciting times. And so um, on the 23rd, is going to feel a lot like uh, years ago when we left, I'm trying to think the right direction. I think it's this way. When we left Abel and walked across over here, except if you're from Odessa, we're not going to walk JBS and 42nd because everyone would die. And it would be the like, travesty of the century. Like, what happened? So uh, we're going to drive over uh, to see our new building on the 23rd. And and just get a chance for all of our people to see what's going on, what God's been doing. And, uh, you know, we're, you guys are welcome to come be a part of that as well. If you are not over here on that Sunday or you're from Odessa, come be with us next week and come check out what's been happening over in the building. And you're going to find a lot of stuff isn't done yet. Uh, we got a couple weeks, so we're, we're kind of rushing to get stuff ready for, um, for our open on the 30th. And then as we're going to be marketing for the 20th and August, for the community. We're really excited about that. So I hope you guys can join that if you are not here on uh, next Sunday. Maybe you're in Odessa. So well, let's jump into today. I'm excited to just keep on keeping on with our wisdom psalms. I want you to go to Psalm 37. Um, psalm 37 is going to be, a, uh, I think, a great chapter for some of us in this room that have been in particular seasons of what we're going to start off with in Psalm 37 is talking about fretting and worrying and having envy, okay? Um, over the last, I would say last week, I've probably had more conversations about this issue of fretting or finding myself in a general sense of discontentment more than I've had in a while. And I find myself in this season as well, in certain things. And so, honestly, where I started studying and started looking at Psalm 37, I really felt like that this particular chapter was going to be a, a, a great one for us today to see what God speaks in his word to us, all right? So as you turn to Psalm 37, we're going to do a lot like we did last week. We're really going to spend about 
we're going to spend most of our time in about four to five verses. And it's going to be Psalm, uh, Psalm 37, 1, and then Psalm 37, verse 3 through 5. All right? So we're going to just get right into it. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm excited about being with you today doing this. So let's turn to Psalm, uh, turn to Psalm 37 and go to verse 1. This is what Psalm 37, verse 1 says. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. I'm just going to say that again. Do not fret because of evildoers. And be not envious toward wrongdoers. So last week we talked about that in a lot of our um, wisdom psalms, we're going to be seeing this dichotomy of the blessed person and the wicked or the evil. And so in this particular one, it starts off by saying, don't fret, don't, don't envy those who are evil or, or wrong or doing wrong. And I think this is so interesting for the writer to tell us to not envy and to not fret. Because I think at some level, if I had to be honest with you, I think that these two words are probably some of the most common emotion that you and I feel in our daily life and in our lives in general. Let me kind of tease this out a little bit. I think, and I see this in my own life, okay, this is just Jeff Turner seeing this in regards to Scripture. A lot of times when I find discontent, discontentment in my life or I'm angry about where the Lord has me or in, in regards to anything, it could be family, relationship, finances, just name it. It usually comes from me fretting or worrying or envying what's happening in your life or someone else's life around me, and I wish I had that for myself. Does that make sense? I, I look at other people's situations. I look at other people's law and life. I look at what they have, what they don't have. I, I was joking with a person this week, and I said I was used that illustration last week about the, the trucks on 42nd Street, but I said there was a little truth to that because, honestly, there's little things in my life where I find myself fretting, envying, worrying. And I think this is something we all go through. Now, in the text here, it talks about fretting or envying evildoers or wrongdoers. So I think there's a certain aspect to our lives that there, we, see, we see bad going on and we wonder why, on the, why in the world is that happening? They're getting off good and I still have this. But I think that there is an a equal proportion to how you and I do life and we still wonder, even if it's not an evil person getting what they deserve or what they're getting, somewhere inside of us, we still struggle with discontentment. And we still struggle with asking why. Why God, why me? Why am I struggling with that? Why do I have to have that and I see other people having this? And just, and just name it. I, I guarantee you that someone in this room at some time in this season has asked the Lord why. I, I feel like I've even asked the Lord why yesterday about a myriad of things. And I think that this is a natural condition of man that we have to submit and put before the Lord because if we don't, I believe it will in turn become poison to our souls. It will become poison to how we see life when we're constantly asking the Lord why, when we're constantly fretting, we're constantly worrying. I wonder, I wonder, I wish. I, and, and it becomes this almost... It deteriorates the soul. And I believe that the writer here, which is David, is going to spend some time giving us what I'm just going to call the antidote, the cure to envy and fretting. And I, I, I probably could spend 30 minutes just talking about why we fret and why we worry. But the reality is, I would imagine that everyone in this room at some point has had worry or envy in their soul of wondering why am I going through this? Why am I here and I wish I was there? Why am I single? Why am I not single? Why, and just, and just list, list what it is, and we've all been through it, and we all at some point will go through it again. So I think this is powerful because I also think that when you look at Scripture and you look at 
kind of when this psalm was written. It possibly was written around David's last years of his life. So if you can kind of imagine an older David, uh, in, 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 in older in his years, speaking back to people who will look at these words and going, I want to speak to you as the Lord speaks to me. Do not fret and do not envy. And here is the antidote and the cure to fretting, worrying, and having envy in your life. I want you to go to Psalm 37. I want you to go to verse 3. And there, there's going to be about four to five pieces that we're going to look at that I believe if we will take hold of them for our life, it will begin to be the solvent on our soul that worries and hurts sometimes. So Psalm 37 verse 3 says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Okay, Trust in the Lord, do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. So this first part is when the writer here talks about trust in the Lord and do good. I wrote this down. I said trust is believing God is good and what he says is good. Trusting in the Lord is believing God is good and believing what he says is good. Now, why is this important in regards to being the antidote to fret and to worry and to envy? Because at some level, if God tells you, I have provided everything that you've needed, if God tells us to not covet our neighbor, if God says, don't even worry about what you wear, what you eat, because even the birds of the air get clothed, they get to eat, don't worry about that because I need you to... If, if we will trust what the Lord says, we will be content in him and trust what he says versus having our worry outside of ourselves. Does that make sense? He says to trust in the Lord and do good. So what that tells me is I need to believe what God says is good and believe what he is, that he is good. You see, and this is going to continue to follow later down this chapter, but I think for most of us, we still do not have a view of God that can be trusted. I still think a lot of us, when we think about God, we, we still think of the cosmic cop that sits in the skies that is concerned about striking with a lightning bolt when you do bad and for you when you do good God it makes God happy I still think that a lot of us still treat God that he is up in the sky just has this general kind of low level discontent towards you and so I kind of have to live my life good because God is kind of always looking at me kind of with the scruff just sort of you better do good boy and that's how I that's that's how a lot of us I still think God, we view God no, he can't be trusted because I see him doing all these bad things around me, and so I better not do bad because that means that I'm doing bad in my life, so I better keep my nose clean. And we'll tell you, this is the furthest thing from the truth. What the truth says is that God gave us freedom. God gave us love. God created us in order for us to have a love relationship with him. But because of our own sin, because of our own vices, we bring those things upon ourselves. And God is in the act of redeeming history. God is in the act of bringing you back peace and love through his son Jesus. But it only happens when you begin to trust what God says. Trust a lot of times, and I, I thought about this, um, trust can be compared to wearing corrective lenses if you can't see very well. When I, was, uh, when I was like in the fifth grade, I was in a class in Snyder. And uh, for whatever reason, all of the cool kids had glasses. And I didn't have glasses. And I thought, I want to be cool. Oh, that's so backwards. It used to be like, I don't want glasses. That's nerdy, whatever. Now, like, all the cool people have glasses. And I still don't have glasses. So I need to get glasses. So I was in the fifth, sixth grade. And uh, I convinced my mom. I was like, Mom, please, like, I'm having a hard time seeing the board. And she said, well, why don't you sit closer? Well, it just isn't working. And so we went to the eye doctor, and they, they made me go through the whole eye test. And I'm just, I don't know how to fake the doctor, but I'm just trying. I'm like, yeah, I don't see that. And, you know, and, and so the doctor goes away, dilates my eyes, and I'm just begging my mom, like, my eyes hurt so bad. And so the doctor asked to speak to my mom. And my mom just comes back with that kind of look. And uh, she goes, and so the doctor says, 
Uh, all right, well, I want to have you look at this picture, and I have some lenses for you. Don't worry. These aren't what we're going to give you, but these are going to help you see. And so I put them on, and they were, they were like the 99-cent Coke bottle glasses you get at, like, the carnival. And I put those dudes on and was like, oh, doctor, I can see. And at that point, I was like, okay. And uh, I tried to fake my mom out, which didn't work very well, but I, I tried so hard to get glasses. Um, so speaking about glasses, a lot of times, and I remember as a, as a kid, my grandfather, every night before he went to bed, he would lay his glasses um, on a table. This is when I would spend the night with my grandparents. And I would go and put them on. And I just wanted to be like my grandfather. When I put those dudes on, my goodness, I couldn't. It was, it was the bifocal. So I was like, oh, oh. And so I feel like I've seen two different dimensions. And so I would take them off, and then I could see again. Well, that was just the opposite for him. Without his glasses, he, he had a hard time seeing but when he put those corrective lenses on, he could then see properly. He could then see with a right perspective. When he put the right lenses on, now he couldn't just put any kind of lens on, right? He had to put the right lenses on to be able to see correctly. And that was going to be able to give him the right sight that he needed. Trust is the same thing. When you and I trust in the Lord, it is like putting on the right corrective lenses in order to see life in a proper perspective. You can't just put on any lens of trust because it will give you a different perspective. It will give you a different off view of the way life is supposed to be. When you and I put the trust of the Lord on, it is the correct lens by which to see life. It gives us God's perspective. It gives us godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. So when we see God's word, it is like putting on God's lenses by which to see, okay, I can believe that he's good and I believe what he says is good. So when I pick up this thing to read, I'm putting on the lens of God, the lens of trust. And I, when I begin to read, I say, when he says these things, I go, I can trust what he says and I can do good based off what he says. Remember, this is an antidote to fret and to worry. So if fretting and worrying is about being worried and discontent and about the life that I'm in and I'm constantly looking out, I'm constantly asking why, I'm constantly worrying. Trust says come back right here and trust the Lord. Quit, quit work, trust what I say about your life right here. And then he follows that with saying trust the Lord and do good. Trusting and believing according to Scripture never stops with a mental ascent. Trusting and believing doesn't end with just changing your heart. You see, I can trust the Lord all day long in my belief, in, my, in what I think, but if I don't act upon it with my hands and my heart, it means nothing to me. If, if the Lord is driving me to serve other people, and I see, and if, if I were to read Scripture and it were to line out certain ways to love one another, to bear one another, to something one another, I in my heart all day long can go, yeah, I believe that's true, Lord, absolutely. Thank you, Lord, for that scripture. But if I don't actually begin to act it out, it means nothing in my life. See, faith and works have always gone together. You go and read the book of James, and he talks about that faith without works is dead. And so I, if I believe what God says, I then have to act upon that. Does that make sense? I have to act upon it. When I act upon it, it does two things for me in regards to fret and worry in my life. It helps me and it helps others. Now, doing good in regards to helping me takes my focus off of myself and places it on someone else's condition, circumstance, or scenario. So watch this. I find myself in discontentment. I'm worried about my life. I'm getting angry about finances, what, whatever, okay? Just whatever discontentment you find in your life. When I take it the mantle and say, I'm going to trust the Lord, I'm going to do good, then I say, Lord, I'm going to go and use what you've given me for someone else. Even in the midst of my pain or my discontentment, I'm going to go serve somebody else. In that moment, I begin to see other people and what they need. And it takes away my angst and my pain and my anger for a moment. And I go, I just, I'm going to be here for this person. 
So not only is it for me, but it also is in helping other people. Trust puts on the lens of God and puts on the lens by which to see that he's good and what he says is good, that I can believe him and I can see life the right way it's supposed to be seen. And then as a result of that, I go and love and serve other people. So then I quit worrying about all of my circumstances and I just for a moment get to be with someone else and serve them in their circumstances. And it just might be that through serving, I realize in my scenario, I, I have a scenario and they have a scenario. And mine's not any worse than them or theirs is not any worse than mine, but it's, in a, it's the human condition that we all are, are struggling with a fallen, broken world. But Christ has come that he's come to redeem the world. And through me, I might be able to help be a redeemer in a broken world. Not that I am the redeemer, but I get to be a conduit to go into someone's, someone else's life to show them the life they could have through him. Trust is the lens by which to see life and get proper perspective. Now, later in this verse, it says, to dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. This one is really interesting because... Um, when you look at the word dwell, this is going to be, I'm going to get nerdy on you just for a second. When you look at all these different translations of the Bible. So when I, when I read the Bible, I read from a translation called the New American, Stand, New American Standard. Some of you have the NIV. Some of you have the ESV. There's all these different translations. A lot of them are good. But a lot of them, it says something in regards to dwelling in the land. Okay, they, they kind of all say about the same thing. But when you get to the second part of this verse, a lot of us in our different translations, it all says something a little differently. Okay, and I even wrote them down. Mine says to cultivate faithfulness. I'm going to show you why this is cool here in a second. In the NIV, it says to enjoy safe pasture. Okay, anyone read the NIV in here? Okay, very cool. So yours says enjoy safe pasture. The NLT says to live safe and to prosper. Who reads the NLT in here? Okay, so you can start to see this. One says to cultivate faithfulness. One says enjoy safe pasture. One says to prosper. ESV says to befriend faithfulness. The King James Version actually says that you shall be fed on the land. So to live securely, to feed on faithfulness, what is the writer trying to get at here? Before I really spent some time looking into this, when I saw that my translation said cultivate faithfulness, I thought it was always in regards to dwell in the land and you go work faithfulness. Like you go do it. But the funny thing about this word cultivate in regards to how the other translations translate this word always comes back to a few of these. To shepherd, to feed, or to graze. To shepherd, to feed, or to graze on God's faithfulness, his truth, and his security. So watch this. When I trust in the Lord and I do good, I am to dwell in the land that God has placed me, both physically and in my life. We'll get there in a second. And as I dwell in the land, I am to feed, graze, shepherd on God's truths, his faithfulness, and who he is. So it all comes back to where I'm at to stay right here and to not get concerned with what's out there in regards to what I have or don't have. When I fret or I worry or I envy, it's because I'm looking out here and seeing what you have. But when I trust the Lord, I go back to what God has given me and I become content right here. Two ways you and I dwell in the land. We dwell with what, let me have to say this. You and I dwell in the lot that God has given us in our life, and you and I dwell in the Permian Basin. Why is this important? For Jeff Turner and the amount of money he has and the house he's been given and the car that I drive and, and the, the wife I have and the kids I have and the family that surrounds me, I can choose to be angry or bitter about any one of those or I can say, God, thank you for what you've given me. So I dwell in myself and the lot of life that's been given to me. Some of you wish you had other professions. Or take solace and trust that what God has you doing right now is a good thing. 
Now, changing your profession is not a bad thing. I'm, I'm saying that's not wrong. But to trust in where you are in life is a good thing. It keeps discontentment far away. It also says to dwell in the land, and I think this is an important one for us, to dwell in the land of the Permian Basin. You see, as, as David's writing to a people that are longing to be in the promised land, and, and, and as, they're, as they're building the kingdom, and he's in his last days of his life, and, and they're, they're, they're dwelling in this place that God has given them, I also believe that here in the Permian Basin, God is calling us to dwell in this place. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with someone that says, and I mean, I love the people here, but it's ugly and I'm ready to get out of here. Or something in regards to, yeah, we moved here from California and we're just looking to get back. Or, and just name it. And you're, you're probably sitting there going, yeah, he's probably had a conversation with me at some point. And so, but what would it look like for us to actually dwell here and love this place? And, and rather than treating the Permian Basin as a place to come, make money, and get out of here, or come here, make money, and go spend it somewhere else, what if it was actually that we, as Christ followers, said, not only does God make beautiful things within me, but what if I was a part of God making beautiful things here in Midland and Odessa? Now, I, I could go on about this in regards to our parks and this place and people, but what would it look like for us to love one another, serve one another, dwell in this place, and say, God, how can you use me to make this place beautiful? Because if not, we're always going to be looking for the next city to go to. We're going to be looking for the next career to go to, the next place to get out of here, the next city to retire to. Or God is saying, what does it look like for you to dwell here and to prosper and to live securely here and to love and to eat on my words, to graze on my faithfulness and not get overly zealous about what's out there, but stick to right here? It would make me start looking at the Lord and saying, Lord, what can I do here because of what you've done in my life? I'm trusting you because you've put me here. And I'm trusting you and what you're doing in my life for this place called Midland and Odessa or Crane or Andrews or Big Spring. And rather than worrying about how much I make or how much I don't make or the, or the career this or the family this or, or this or that, Lord, I, I'm going to stay right here. And I'm going to trust you. I want to serve my family. I want to serve the people that are around me. I want to trust in you. I want to do good. I'm going to dwell in this land, and I'm going to cultivate. I'm going to graze. I'm going to feed on your faithfulness. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to love what you do. And as you move and work in my life, I will follow where you lead me. But I'm not going to be overly zealous and discontent with my life and all of my possessions and things I have. Now, this isn't to say you don't have dreams about what God is doing in your life. That's a completely different that's a completely different conversation. This has nothing in regards to the dreams that God has placed in your heart. This has everything to do with you fretting and worrying about your life and envying what other people have or that you don't have. Trust the Lord and do good. Dwell in this place. Cultivate faithfulness. Eat on what God has given you. Trust in his faithfulness. Devour what he's given us and trust the Lord. Trust him and cultivate faithfulness. Now, I want to take you to verse 4 because this is continuing on. It's, it's continuing to speak to us about this truth of what we should do in regards to fretting and envy. And verse 4 is going to be a lot about what I spoke on last week. Verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, Last week, I, I heard more people say, hey, I, I don't think I can ever eat a steak the same way after last week. If you were here with us last week, and I talked about Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. I, 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 I just love the fact that a lot of you connected with that story because I'm a carnivore and I love meat and butter and fat. It's wonderful. But using that illustration of delighting in that steak in that moment is such a great picture that it helped connect you to think through what it means to delight in the Lord. And and. And I'll just say this week what I said last week. A lot of us can't delight in the Lord because we haven't experienced him. 
You cannot talk about the best steak in the world until you've had it. You cannot talk about and just fill in the blank until you've experienced it. So it's hard for you and I to delight in something that we haven't experienced. So this is why I believe in verse 4, when it says to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give the desires of your heart, it's going to take the Lord doing this in your life as you go to him. This is not something that you can do only on your own. Because, again, going back to this reality of trust, we don't have a proper view a lot of times of the Lord that he is good. So it's hard for us to delight in him. Again, there's this natural bent inside of my heart that looks at God and says, I don't know if you're really good or not. I don't know if I can trust you. But the word tells us, David has to remind us to delight in the Lord. So as I choose to cherish him, and I love to sit with him, and as I seek to have him speak to me through his word and enjoy a relationship with him, it then says, he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I know we've spoken about this several times in, in this place, but this, this, verse is not, uh, this verse is not that if you delight in the Lord, then he'll give you all of the things you want outside of the Lord. Um, one of the greatest expressions I've heard spoken of of heaven was when my youth pastor, when I was in the seventh grade, asked me, hey, Jeff, if you could go to heaven and there was no Jesus, you could just get all the cool things of heaven. Would you still want to go to heaven? I was like, well, I guess. I mean, sure. It's what I've been told. Like, heaven's going to be like streets of gold, mansions, and all this fun stuff. Like, I, I guess I don't see how Jesus is really part of it. He said, That's, you've missed the whole point of heaven. Because heaven is about Christ. So in the same way, if I delight myself in the Lord, but then I have all these other things that I'm desiring in my heart, I've kind of missed the point in what I've delighted in. However, if I delight myself in the Lord and I truly begin to cherish him and love him and spend time with him, here's what happens. My heart begins to change. As I delight in the Lord, I begin asking the Lord to fill me with the things of him in my soul and in my heart. Because I know, according to what Christ said, out of my heart comes filth and destruction and sin. So I have a flesh on me, but I have to ask the Lord to change my heart. I have to go to him, delight in him, and ask him to change what's inside of me. So what happens is, as I delight in the Lord, he gives me the desires of my heart. What are the desires of my heart? To want him more. So I delight in the Lord, I desire him. And it becomes this perpetual continuation of saying, Lord, I want you, and therefore you're going to put the desires of my heart to want you all the more. And so as a result, what gets filled in my heart is the Lord. Only because of him. And then as he changes my heart and gives me a new heart, I begin to then want the things of him. This is John 14, 14. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. We joke a lot that this is not saying, I'm going to pray whatever I want and attach Jesus' name on it, and then it's going to happen. This is as the Lord changes my heart, I begin to want the things of the Lord. So maybe it's how you begin to pray differently. Maybe instead of praying Lord, would you change their heart because I'm getting so irritated at them? You begin to say, Lord, would you change my heart? Instead of saying, Lord, would you just fix my kids? I swear, you would go, Lord, would you teach me about how my kids are wired? Instead of saying, Lord, I'm getting so tired of when my spouse does da 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 maybe you begin to pray, Lord, would you change my heart in understanding how my wife perceives something or how my husband perceives something? It begins and comes back to this corrective lens of changing and asking, Lord, would you change my heart? Not change them, but change me first. Change my desires. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I think when you begin to pray God-sized prayers because of what God's been doing in your heart, you will see magnificent things happen. Now, they may not always happen the way you think they're supposed to happen. But God is working his will and his good pleasure in our lives to see his kingdom advanced. And he loves to use us because God loves you. 
And God loves to change your heart because he knows that the brokenness that the world is around us and what sin has done has corrupted our view of him. God loves to change your heart, but God loves when you ask him to help change your heart because God is not a forceful hand on you. You are not a robot that he just sort of one day kind of goes in with the screwdriver and fixes something. You kind of stand up right and get fixed because you were messing up. No, God treats you as his child. And you and I both know with children, you can't make them do certain things. You can make them, but in the end, it may not be exactly the love relationship you were asking for. You tenderly walk with your kids sometimes or with your wife or your husband. And it's a relationship. And God does the same thing with us. But he delights when you ask him to change your heart. This last piece in verse 5 is really the last application of this entire um, entire teaching where it says in verse 5, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Um, If it was last year, a couple years ago, Dustin Pierce was up on stage actually talking about this verse. And the, the word to commit to the Lord in the Hebrew is this, is this word picture of rolling a ball to the Lord, rolling something to the Lord. And so when I was, uh, when I was um, father of my son, Nolan, when he was little, and or Gwendolyn, just like any parent, we'd love to roll our, the ball back and forth to each other, and they would just laugh and love, and they would, you know, roll it back. And, and so really it's this picture of a culmination of all of these things saying to the Lord, I'm committing this to you. God, I don't get why I don't have this. God, I worry about my health, my husband's health, my wife this. I'm concerned, I fret, I envy, I worry. And God says, bring it right back here, child. I am in the one that's in control. Roll and commit your way to me. Rolling what you have in front of your life to the Lord is this picture of saying, Lord, have it. Lord, would you take it? Now, this isn't the picture of, okay, Lord, you got it? Okay, before it gets to you, okay, I'm seeing thanks, Lord. It's a picture of you continually being before the Lord as you roll these cares to him. Now, on the other side, this is not the picture of you rolling the ball to the Lord and him on the cell phone going, hey, hold on, bud, just a little bit. But I'm doing a lot of more important things. I got Trump on the phone. It's, it's, I am rolling the ball to you, Lord, and the Lord and his magnificent wonder and his ability to be everywhere at once, to know all things at once, to be all powerful all the time, can sit in front of you as well as anyone else in this room and receive the ball from you and accept your commitment to him. When you worry and when you fret, you can take that ball and roll to him. It is not this passive, submissive, Lord, I'm just no good, whatever. This act of committing the ball to the Lord in regards to all of these things is the picture of fighting. It's the picture of fighting for your soul to say, Lord, I have all this angst built up. I have all this fret and envy and worry. And God, I'm going to trust and do good. I'm going to dwell in the land and believe you're good. I'm going to delight in you and desire all that you have for me. I'm going to delight in you. And guess what, Lord? I want to commit to you my way. I want to roll it to you because honestly, Lord, I'm having a hard time handling the ball myself. And the Lord is a great ball handler. He is a great person. He is the greatest to handle your problems and handle your care and to handle your worry and your anxiety and your fret. And as someone prayed earlier, right before we got in here, some of you walked into this room today and you feel like a pressure cooker about to go off because life just feels like if it gets anything else, this balloon's about to explode. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord desires for you to roll all of that to him. Now, tomorrow it may be that you wake up and the problems didn't get quote-unquote fixed, but you have began this relationship of saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Okay, Lord, instead of getting getting, fretting and worrying about what's happening good or bad around me or the world or my company, Lord, right here, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do good. I'm going to dwell on the land. I'm going to cultivate. I'm going to eat I'm going to graze upon your goodness. I'm going to delight in you. Even though everything else tells me God is bad or God is dead, I'm going to believe that you're good. 
I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to commit myself to you. So today, I want to ask you two things, and then we're going to finish up. What's the thing that is agitating you in your life? What is the thing that you're fretting over? What's the thing you find yourself having envy over? What, what is that thing? And, and then secondly, are you willing to begin to say, Lord, would you change my heart that I would commit my way to you and that I would fight? Fighting is persistence and patience of constantly rolling that ball to the Lord. It, that, that ball may feel like it comes, sits in our lap again sometimes when you roll it to the Lord and give our cares to him that he loves when you and I delight in him. Let's pray. Father, we, we often have so many things that are giving us worry and we fret over. But God, I believe that through Psalm 37, we have the ability to trust in you, to do good, to graze on the land that's been given us, graze on your faithfulness right here in front of us. And God, I believe in so doing, we begin to delight in you and to have our hearts changed because we're asking you to change our heart. Lord, we love you and you love us so much that you showed us this demonstration through your son, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for letting me be here today. Have a great one. God bless.